What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 98 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we're joined by Joe Watkins. He is a global synthetic turf technical consultant with 30 years of experience in the industry and millions of square feet installed, along with being the inventor of many tools in the industry. And he talks with us about everything you would want to know about synthetic turf, including selling, installing, and commonly overlooked aspects of synthetic turf. So without further ado, let's get into this. Today, we're joined by Joe Watkins, or also known as SJW Online. He is a global synthetic turf technical consultant with close to 30 years of synthetic turf experience and millions of square feet of synthetic grass installed, as well as an inventor in the industry. Obviously, we've got the right guy today to talk to us about installing artificial grass. Joe, thank you and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for that introduction. Appreciate that. Joe, let's get started to get to know a little bit more about yourself, context about yourself in the industry. What brought you to installing in, installing synthetic grass? And can you just walk us through your backstory in, into this industry? Well, my parents were in the ready mix concrete industry. And I became a concrete contractor at a very young age. And I got into the synthetic turf business due to uh, having to pour large slabs at 3 a.m. in the morning. And it just was a a rough business. And and then I thought, uh, you know, the synthetic turf is you only got one color, green, green, and green. And if you have an issue with it, you just pop up a piece and put another one down. It's very simple. You don't have to carry a jackhammer or compressor around if you have issues with concrete. So it was a, it was a, it was a good move that I made at the time, mainly because a lot of uh, water authority companies were starting to give rebates. So uh, and it was started being considered as a mulch. So that's how I moved into that direction. Yeah. So Joe, once you decided that this is something that you wanted to get in, into, what was your route into the industry? Did you start your own installation company right away? And uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I did some research uh, regarding uh, synthetic turf and uh, mainly due to sports fields um, because that was what was pushed back then other than landscape synthetic turf. And the landscape synthetic turf that was being made back then was nothing but short piled sports turf um, and the gauges, which is the stitch rows uh, in between the uh, stitch rows. uh, They were actually up to one inch and a a kid could seam them. It was easy to uh, place and it more looked like outdoor carpet um, that people used to uh, glue down on their patios um, for uh, beautification. And so um, I got into it mainly because of the rebate started and, um, it was a dollar f- a foot back then, and um, I did some research and got a hold of some manufacturers and um, started putting in some synthetic turf. And year after year, the fibers have evolved and the installation techniques evolved. And uh, over the years and decades, the installations became harder and um, and more sophisticated. And now it became. Uh, an industry where you have now have synthetic turf craftsmen. Getting more into this, um, over the years, you've got close to 30 years experience in the industry. And over the years, you have actually invented uh, a couple of tools for the industry. What, where do these tools come from? First of all, what are they? Where, where did you get the idea to, to create them? And where do they fit in, in terms of the installation process? Well, uh, that all happened uh, when I became a union synthetic turf contractor and I was putting all the synthetic turf down the middle of the Las Vegas strip medians. And the first contract we had was at the Russell Road going all the way through Tropicana. Uh, And then we, the second phase uh, was from Tropicana uh, to the city center. And the second phase, they came out with a very, very dense turf. Um, I think um, I was one of the first to actually put it in. Um, it was a Tiger Turf brand, um, amazing product. And um, we had actually worked from two o'clock in the morning till 10 a.m. And we had to have the barricades up and the strip opened up for, for the cars. And it, when the sun came up, the first island, we could see some lines uh, where we had put the turf in. My guys were amazing at seams. I was down on my knees with them. We couldn't understand why. And then so we realized 
um, after me studying it and uh, engineering some uh, uh, how the fibers were reacting, uh, it's all due to pressure. Um, the thicker turf has pressure when it's tufted through the backing. So it's very dense. So whenever you cut off the scrim, which is a leftover on the roll, and a lot of guys go in a couple gauges in just to make a clean edge for the seam, that fiber automatically hangs over due to pressure. So what happens is whenever you connect section one with the fibers that are hanging over due to the pressure, and you can't connect section two to section one with the fibers hanging over due to pressure, those fibers cross. And when they cross, especially when you're connecting them as per the uh, manufacturer's gauge specifications, and you put them together three eighths, they will cross at the top. And when they do that, the UV sunlight shines a different color on them. And, and that's what we now call in the industry, the Mohawk. And so uh, what I did was figured out a way to integrate that uh, to be hidden. So, I mean, I did a shark tooth method. I mean, I've got every type of shape patented uh, known to man right now of, of an integration for synthetic turf. And the shark tooth would hide it, but when we ran over it with the power brooms, it, it wasn't stable enough. So um, I invented and patented this uh, a special uh, contour that when you put them together, the convect and concave part of the tool well, uh, after you cut it, um, the fibers will hang over on one side on the convex or concave, and then they will uh, actually lean over the other way on the concave or convex, uh, depending how you uh, put them together. So what it does, it integrates the, the seam and um, causes the, uh, that mohawk to be uh, invisible. And you also uh, have a brush in, in terms of another product that you've installed for the industry. What, what is this brush? Where does it fit in terms of the installation process? And what does, was it, what does it do? Well, I didn't know I was going to come on here and plug my products, but uh, I'll make <laughs> it real quick. I'll make it real quick. The turf brush I invented, I was doing a uh, training on a small soccer field. Uh, they had hired uh, in San Diego. They had hired some labor ready guys to show up to rake all the rubber in uh, for the field. And they didn't show up. Um, but they had these drop spreaders, which were uh, Scott's classic drop spreaders. And, and so what I did is I just cut out the bottom of those uh, because we had to ballast the first sections with silica sand. So they bought, I don't know, five or six of these. And so I ended up taking the Makita and cutting out the bottom and then duct taping a rake on the back of it. And they were dumping it in with trash cans so I could make my plane flight out of there <laughs> back home. And so um, I took a video of that and started getting a light bulb up and said, hey, man, I need to make something like this because – it uh, actually brushed it in at the same time. So and now I patented uh, the turf brush, which hooks uh, on the back of a classic drop spreader, which is the number one drop spreader that all the landscapers use. And what it does is it will brush in the infill at the same time. I mean, completely brush it in easily um, at the same time. And it's very easy to use. And um, uh, I'm really proud of that one. All right. So we've already been talking about a lot of things that our audience has to digest right now in terms of the artificial grass itself. You mentioned the scrim gauge. You mentioned uh, also seam installation as well as the brushing of the infill. So l let's get into this and into artificial turf. And, and starting with why would somebody opt to go with artificial turf for their property or in even in terms of a an installer wanting to add this in terms of their services that they want to offer it's really huge for a landscaper to put in synthetic turf uh, into their portfolio um, mainly due to a majority of landscapers are pushing it as one of their uh, top items uh, now because the money per square foot um, sure beats putting in just regular rock landscape rock. Uh, the benefits of a homeowner having synthetic turf is uh, there's such a wide range. I could speak for days on it. Um, number one, uh, it's saving uh, water. Uh, and when they're saving water, they're saving money on their water bill. Uh, that's one. Beautification, um, it's always green um, all year round. Uh, I know a lot of people love natural grass, but uh, eventually after they get strong armed by their neighbor that has synthetic turf, they eventually change it over because it's a no brainer. You don't have to maintain or take care of it. And uh, except, you know, you do have to blow it off and, and keep it clean, but you're, you're able to go on vacations, not worried about your, you know, your grass being water riot or your schedule times on watering. Some 
common things that I see with artificial grass and why a customer might come back and say, well, I heard that it traps heat or I heard they're unsafe or does the material fade? Does it melt under the heat, especially in the southern states where you guys get uh, up into the temperatures? What are some common things? things that you hear in terms of maybe a customer coming back at you and saying, well, maybe I don't want artificial grass because of this. Like, um, does it actually trap heat? Does it melt? Uh, Let's start there. Well, let's just start with it's a plastic. And so and if you're going to be a professional um, in a synthetic turf industry, you have to educate, you know, your front line of uh, even your clients of, of it's a plastic um, it's it's not going to generate heat it, uh, it'll absorb heat um, and you know I'm from Las Vegas Nevada and we have sometimes temperatures of 118 like I've always instructed salespeople if you're at a client's house and you see that they have toddlers then you need to respect the fact that if they're in a region that has high heat that you need to let them know that the synthetic turf is going to become hot uh, during the middle time of the day. Um, It's a fact. And so majority of clients that I've spoken with that here in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a very hot uh, place, is that um, they're okay with it because their toddlers don't go out in 117 degree weather. And so, um, or even go out to play on that. So, I mean, there's pros and cons on all of it. Um, people say, well, can you cool it off? And, and yes, you could cool it off. You could actually mist it down for a little bit. Uh, but you got to be careful there too, because some people have hard water uh, that comes out of their, uh, their plumbing. And, and some of that hard water will lay upon the turf. And then you'll be getting calls about uh, hard water deposits. So, yes, it'll cool down. Um, uh, if you had, had missed it. Um, and there also is some, uh, some t- end fills on the market now um, that actually absorb moisture um, that keep the turf cool. Um, but I would really be careful um, because of the absorbance and infills that are absorbents. They uh, absorb blood, urine, and vomit. So sometimes uh, you, we, you want to shy away with that. Gotcha. Gotcha. And in terms of melting, um, you know, reflections from windows or having a, I guess, a barbecue right nearby, are we, should we be concerned about that as well? Oh, everybody should be concerned about that. Um, and in the, in the industry or the client, the front line, because what happens is the salespeople, it starts with the salesperson. They have to come out there and do a schematic of the drawing or whatever the case may be. And even if they don't, if you're a contractor that just shoots from the hips and, and uh, works out of your truck, then you need to also recognize if the windows are there and they're facing south and that there possibly will be a, a, an issue. Um, here's, a, here's a good story. I had a contractor call me up and he said, JW, I can't believe what happened. And he said, I, I, I had to put a whole huge yard in. And, and next thing you know, this lady's just burned the crap out of me, sent me a picture of it. And, uh, and it was really melted pretty bad. And, and he said, what do I do? And I said, well, you know what? You should have been educated. You know, you can't, you can't you know, charge her for another whole yard. Maybe speak with her a little bit. And, and, but she's going to have to get window coverings. And yes, it's not your fault. But, you know, we have to have integrity in this industry and help the client out when, when you know, the acts of, of this uh, happen. Well, he went ahead and replaced the whole backyard for free. And it happened again because it was the neighbor's window. <laughs> so whenever you're out on a project, you, you have to look at everybody's window, any window that's going to be facing um, even over the wall. Synthetic turf uh, is a plastic. And what's happened is whenever there's low E windows that generate high heat, over 200 degrees, 220, it will start curling the fiber. It will start breaking down over days and even months and start curling it and drawing it down to the backing. So what happens is it's if you don't get a phone call, you will if you didn't do your due diligence of, of seeking out if there's any type of windows facing where the window glare might hit that turf. And there is synthetic turf on the market that's high, that is a nylon, higher uh, uh, product for, uh, uh, no, wait, hold on, let me back up. There is a product there. Let's back up. There is products on the, on the market that, um, uh, have a high resistance, um, that are out there that if they, um, if they are around hotels that have big glass windows, then, 
they would probably want to tend to using more of a uh, nylon uh, fiber. Gotcha. So definitely uh, being educated on that and in terms of choosing the right product for the install, but also, uh, as you said, knowing where these uh, window glares come in in, into play in the grass, as well as designing around that possibly. What about fading from from UV rays? Uh, Do do, uh, modern day artificial turfs fade in, in the sun? Well, a majority of the manufacturers that are out there now are are having yarns that are UV inhibitant where there's no fading. Um, that was a thing in the past, and a majority of the yarn manufacturers um, uh, have actually uh, upped the performance on that. So I, I wouldn't really be a huge focus on that um, as it's even uh, being in the industry anymore. But remember this: if you do choose a product that is inferior, it might fade immediately if you're in that type of heat region. Gotcha. Which is a great segue to our next talking about the right product to choose and what you should be looking for, not just in terms of manufacturer, but also in terms of the grass itself, the look that you're going for. Where do we even start when it comes to choosing the right product for our client and for the installation purpose? Well, that starts with the service. Um, What type of service is that turf going to provide? Is it uh, commercial or is it residential? That's where you start off because you might have more wear and tear on a commercial. So you might need to choose a a, a different type of yarn and, and, and structure for that system. Um, it, uh, if it's just for normal landscape, uh, for like a kidney bean shape out in front of a yard that, you know, just for beautification, then uh, there, these manufacturers, they've got hundreds of, of styles that anybody could choose for just regular landscape, uh, product. And then you also have to recognize if it's a backyard and you want the pretty, uh, synthetic turf, um, do you actually have pets? Um, uh, is it in a flood zone? Um, because then you have to understand I might need to get a hundred percent permeable backed product so that I can have better permeation through the turf due to having pets and maintaining it more and having to flush it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variables that you need to ask yourself before you choose a product. A lot of clients and homeowners, and even landscapers push beautification. And then they get a lot of phone calls uh, due to matting because it was in a high traffic area or it stinks because they didn't, you know, they didn't order a hundred percent permeable pet turf and they just used a pretty landscape turf with the, with the holes, the drainage holes every four to six inches on center. So it, it just becomes all about service. What's the purpose of that turf? And then in terms of, I know there's different heights of the uh, actual turf itself and different weights. What do all these refer to and, and what are we looking for? Is if we're let, let, Let's focus on residential. If we're going for a residential installation, uh, let's say they have no pets. How do we know what, what we're looking for in terms of the height, in terms of the weight of that turf? A majority of homeowners tend to go for the more plusher synthetic turf, the more softer fiber, uh, the, the turf that's that's dense, very dense and 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 uh, and tall in pile height. Um, it could reach up to a two and a quarter inch in pile height. And for me, <clears throat> I actually I actually teach this. If you have a, a a push broom, and the push broom has about ten inches you know, like the, like the asphalt brooms or the rooftop brooms, they're really long. And the shorter it is, the more abrasive it becomes like a brush, like a brush. So, so a lot of people will say, well, JW, my turf is matting uh, uh, throughout this area where everybody walks. Well, that's where I say, well, maybe you should have used a lower pile height because the fibers do become, when you cut that down, lower to the base, they become more uh, stiffer. Yeah, so when you're walking on them, some don't, some are short pile height, they're very soft and uh, they'll mat immediately. So the pile height has to depend on the service and the purpose. If you had a synthetic turf that was four inches tall, which I've never seen, and you actually place it properly with the infill up against hardscape, you wouldn't know if that turf was four inches or if it was inch and seven eighths, if it was done properly. So I recommend, you know, having a turf 
uh, inch and seven eighths and, and, and a tad bit taller and fill it properly, um, you'll get more longevity because remember, the closer the backing is to the heat and the UV sunlight, the less longevity that turf's going to have. In terms of longevity, since we're on the subject, what do we typically see in terms of uh, manufacturer warranties and longevity that you'll get out of uh, an artificial turf? Well, the warranties have actually went up. They've, they've went from eight. Uh, then on some products, they went to 10. And now the uh, uh, majority of them are uh, pushing to uh, 15. Most manufacturers uh, are producing some pretty good warranties right now in the industry. Even in your own experience, like how much, how many years do you, you typically see out of, a gra- uh, out of an artificial turf? Well, I have actually, um, I have turf that's been down on certain playgrounds that's still there. And it's uh, made 20, 22 years. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it depends all about the fiber and also how they maintain them, you know, because if you're not going to, like I said, protect that, that uh, bat and keep the infill uh, properly, I mean, it can mat um, because, you know, there's matting goes on it. The matting is, is going to happen. But uh, if you maintain the infill levels, then your turf will, uh, will, will last the, uh, the warranty period time or even more. So let's get into the installation process and proper installation. And I understand that uh, from what I understand, the base preparation is very similar to what we would see with installing a hardscape patio uh, paver in terms of the drainage is necessary. The drainage is key and in preparing the bases is crucial for that drainage. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that relates to artificial turf installation? Yeah, you know, there's always questions regarding, you know, hey, JW, how deep do I have to dig on this project? You know, because all I'm doing is just removing the grass, what's there and putting in the turf. Well, you know, there's more to that because every job's different. Um, And so then you have to understand drainage and permeation. Um, Because what happens is if you could have the best turf, which is even a hundred percent permeable pet turf, and you could put it on a surface that is very slow in permeation. Um, well, that's just going to cause that turf to start smelling a lot faster because it's uh, that urine is going to be settling on the top part of that soil until anything else pushes it through. So, you know, I recommend. Um, like I said, what is a service? Um, it, it, the biggest issue that I see is not just the preparation of the sub base, because you have to have a great permeable sub base um, for your synthetic turf area, um, mainly because you don't want to end up in a lawsuit. And I'll tell you why. Um, the, the, oh, God, I got to, I want to, let me, let me sidebar real quick with you. I'm, I'm an expert witness on a case where all the water drained and flood off this house, turf in, and water sloped because the backyard sloped. Do nothing else, nothing different. And so what they did is they, they went ahead and ripped out all the grass and then put this putting green in and sloped it. And guess what? All that water got sat underneath. And now that synthetic turf was nothing but a slip and slide for water and it went all into the house. From what I understand is the installation of a paver base patio would be very similar to that of a a artificial turf. Um, It is for compaction because you definitely want to make sure your sub of the turf um, is compacted uh, for flooding um, and there's a lot of traffic afterwards. It's not going to settle. But uh, a lot of times you have to understand what the service is. Uh, if they're going to have uh, pets and then you want to over excavate. And then the question is, is how many pets, you know, because you could go down four inches and then you find out six dogs like, Oh, I better go down 12. And that's the only reason that deep so that, that your asset could be flushed and cleaned out through that, that as a pet turf, um, a normal landscape. Um, I would recommend excavating the natural soil. If you do, and putting down a minimum of two to four inches of some good uh, import. And uh, could be anywhere from chat, 
G number seven type two road base. As long as it's a good permeable wash uh, sand that will hold its compaction and permeate well. So we would typically install a uh, like a granular A, like a three quarter crushed uh, angular vines as a traditional base in our industry. And, and we would put down a a fabric separator between the sub base and the preparation of that base. Is that something that you would be see similar in your industry as well? Well, I do. And mainly, I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons on that. You know, by putting a, a, a filter fabric below um, your crushed aggregate, a lot of fields are done that way. But if it's for, I would not put any, any filter down below there, um, mainly because number one, if you did have a huge flood, you have to ask yourself, how fast does that filter fabric permeate? How fast does that filter fabric drain? Because if it's got a big flood and you got seven dogs then everything's going to be washed down and now it's got to get through that filter fabric. So you have to figure out what the service is for. Now, if you're in an area that had Bermuda grass, which is very hard to kill, um, then definitely, yes, I would put that down plus um, some pre-emergent and be careful not to get it around uh, living plants. Um, but the filter fabric um, is good for uh, to protection weeds coming through. Um, but I, you know, putting it way down below, I, it depends on service. That's every, every project's different. So Joe, what's the optimal like uh, base in, in terms of preparation for that permeation, especially in a pet uh, installation? Well, this is what I say. A lot of people use a road base type two, any type of aggregate that's mixed chat, um, DG, that's mixed with uh, finer sands uh, with the aggregate. Um, I recommend uh, bringing in four to six inches of three quarter inch aggregate, plate compacting it. Yes, the plate compactor, you could, you know, drag your foot across and it'll loop, but the plate compactor actually top surface to lock in and prepare you for the next step. And the next step would be putting on a one inch, just a one inch uh, of a DG or a three eighths minus 57, something smaller. And then, and then compact that into the three quarter inch rock bed that you just, uh, you just created. Why do you do that JW? Well, first of all, you want to be able to have a smooth surface for that turf to lay on. And second of all, you, when you compact only one inch, half of that's going to go down in and lock three quarter inch aggregate, especially if you know what you're doing on before you compact it. And then now you have a crust to put on because eventually if it's a pet area, especially a, uh, uh, a facility for pets, they're going to continue. They have to wash that daily, daily. So what's going to happen to all that fines when you flush it? Cause that's how you got to kill the, the uric acid. You have to flush it. So when you flush that, what does it do to those fines? It degrades them. It drops them down in the three quarter inch anyways. So why are you going with two to three inches of DG on top of that three quarter? Why don't you just add more uh, one or two inches of three quarter inch rock and then only put one inch of DG on top? Because eventually it's going to start settling into the three quarter. And the minimum you have on the top, the fast that will faster the uric acid and uh, every contaminant will flow through there. Yeah, that makes total sense. And in terms of what our industry is also adapting uh, in, in the open graded space system to allow for that drainage to flow much easier through. As far as I know, putting green turf, it doesn't have the drainage holes in it. So what what would the base be like for a putting turf? Could You wouldn't use the open graded three quarter clear, would you? Well, you wouldn't because this this time you want you want density. Right. Because remember that that rock will move on even in frost areas. Mm -hmm. So you do want to be the, the, you know, it's for me, if it's a big drainage area I, and a problem, I would use four inches of three quarter inch rock. And then I would go over it with, a, you know, a good two to three inches of compacted DG or, or three eighths minus. Because what happens is you can't you can't contour and get that top surface with only an inch of DG or, or three eighths minus. You got to go at least three to get you a nice smooth surface when you grade it with a rake or anything. Otherwise you're going to be flipping up rocks. So in terms of base, I think we're, we're all caught up with what we would do when it comes to installing now the turf. Wh what does that look like uh, from, from that, that three eighths chimp chip is uh, put in 
and now we're installing the turf. Where do we even begin? Well, you're going to start with your design because every synthetic turf install needs a design or a schematic. And, and on that schematic, if you want to, if you want to make good money and, and be profitable and productive, you have to have a, a, a plan. And, um, and what happens is that plan will start where your section is going to be laid. And, um, and the first thing that I always uh, teach was where the seam is going to be going, you know, cause sometimes you will have to uh, have a lot more waste to have less seams than you would be um, trying to save money. So you have to locate where the seams are going to be on the dimensions uh, of it, get it out. And then I say, whenever you start putting sections together, you always have to start at the seam. And so we've designed it, we've planned for it. We are installing the, the, the turf and we're getting to that seam. I know uh, seam installation is an incredibly important part to the process. Can we touch on that to make sure that we know how that goes in properly? Well, let's just say you have a rectangular turf area and you're going to be putting two sections in. I would lay the two sections. Uh, I would definitely have ordered enough waste to overlap the hardscape edge. I would start at the seam. I would start at the seam by securing section one to the left and then cutting the scrim and preparing the seam of section one, then grabbing section two and connecting it together to the manufacturer's gauge specifications, secure section two, then go that out three foot on each side of each seam. And I always like starting on the first seam because then once you steam tape and glue and you have the bags on there compressing, you could start working your way out and the guys could secure it and cut the edges while the seam cures. And then when they get to the, the third section, you're able to pull the bags from section one to section two once you do you repeat the, the first step. And in terms of that seam adhering, what are the different uh, things that are that are brought in to, to adhere it? Like the, the seam tape, I know, the adhesive. And are there any spikes in terms of making sure that that uh, turf is going to stay in place for the, the long term? Well, when you secure, when you first put section one down and section two, you, you, you always run a, a row of uh, temporary spikes down each side, approximately two foot away from the seam on each side. So it doesn't move. You want to keep them in most of the day before you start putting the infill in, just in case if you're in the hot regions, it might want to cause that seam to separate if, uh, if that uh, adhesive isn't starting to tack. Um, a lot of guys want to stitch the seam even after they glue. Um, you know, if it works for you, do it. Um, but for me, I, I, I say take section one and section two off the roll and put it together like no one ever touched it. And then you don't have to worry about any mishaps or trampling on the seam because what happens is when you have a big guy and he's trampling on the seam and he's stitching it with, with nails and he's going back and forth. And believe me, I, I know a lot of guys that, that do this and they're really good and their jobs turn out beautiful. But what happens is you got to get the lightest guy on there because that heaviness will cause those fibers to start losing their memory. Yes. Losing their memory. And when you go back on your pictures and you say, why does that seem a lot lighter in color? It's because it's been mashed and the UV sunlight is shining on it differently than everything else. And then you also have fibers that are darker than your rest of your jobs. And that's because they're out there brushing the crap out of it, trying to make it look better and the more, the more they scratch it, the more the UV sunlight does not shine on it whatsoever. And then you go, well, JW, what do I do about that? Well, you got to go brush that whole 2,000 square feet just like you did that seam. You spike it in place, seam tape goes down, uh, adhesive goes on the seam tape, the two pieces come together, and you want the lightest guy kind of doing that so that it's not matting down the grass uh, and putting up that pressure, right? Well, you, you, you know, you could work, I, I say work outside the seam. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but a lot of guys, they like, you know, crawling over the seam. And not only that, when you get done gluing it, you know, and they're putting it together, you know, sometimes them lighter guys will go ahead and will do the, pr the first compression with their knees and put it right into place where it's got to be before they put, you know, the compression, their bags on it. Um, so, but what happens is if you're, if you've got a big guy in your crew, you, you, he's got to work from the side because it, it does, it affects the seam, whether you, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. 
And what are the bags for, for the compression on that seam? Well, a majority of adhesives in this world, they need compression. And so uh, if you're going to be putting down synthetic turf, you're going to have to have some type of compression. Um, just like when you break a plate, you're sitting there holding the plate together until it starts to come together. Well, that's what you need for, for adhesives for synthetic turf. You need compression. So that glue could actually be compressed, goes up through the gauges, locks in, and, um, and, and creates a, a perfect bond when it's cured. If you don't, a majority of synthetic turf glues out there are moisture cure urethanes. And if you do not do any type of compression, then you might possibly have some type of elevation lift when that glue cures. And is there like, can I just use as much glue as I want on that seam to make sure that there, that, that those two turf pieces are going to stick <laughs> together? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. Because like I said, moisture cure urethane, if it's down an eighth of an inch, it could, it could cure at a quarter. So you got to be careful and read your specifications because moisture cure urethane, especially if you're in a Florida or if you're in the Bahamas and there's a, it just got done raining, even Texas areas, they'll, you know, I'll get phone calls saying, Hey, JW, you know, uh, I got it rained yesterday and I'm saying, Hey, just be careful and maybe babysit your guys when they're trialing. And also babysit your guys when they're nailing the seam tape in place because some guys leave divots. And if there's an eighth of an inch of glue sitting on that nail head and you put another eighth of an inch on top, in that area, you might have an issue coming up through a drainage hole or something. Gotcha, gotcha. So that seam tape sits flush, especially when it's nailed in. Otherwise, you do get that divot. Now, what about around the edges where there isn't seams? How do we ensure that that's going to stay in place? So say it's like butting up against a, uh, a hardscape or around a curb of a garden uh, bed. How do we know that that's going to stay in place? What do we do there? Well, you could use embeds, um, staples, uh, turf nails, uh, but I would go every uh, four to six inches on center and a half inch from the edge. And in our uh, world, I guess we excavate past our border paver, uh, the depth of the base. So if our base is six inches, we're going six inches past that border stone Very to smart. ensure that it's sitting there. Do we do the same with the synthetic turf if we're going, say, into a garden bed? Most definitely. You have to over-excavate any synthetic turf area. And mainly because if it's a play area, you got egress. Egress means people coming in and out. And so when you have a lot of traffic, that pressure pound, pound, pound continually if you stop it on the edge, that edge is going to start curling. And in terms of infill installation, like we have our grass all installed. It's looking uh, pretty good. What is infill? What's the purpose of it? And how do we install it, especially with your uh, invention there? Well, you don't have to have my invention install it, just to let you know. But, uh, um, but I appreciate that. Decades ago, when synthetic turf didn't even look like synthetic turf, the actual infill that was put in, most of it was like coal slag and some raw silica. Um, it was mainly just uh, to keep it flat and from blowing away and, um, and, and, and protected from the sun and from degradation. Uh, now the infill, synthetic turf infill, has evolved uh, dramatically by having all types of infill that is coated with microban, which... Uh, is not it protects with uh, all types of bacteria and uh, blood urine and vomits and and it, it allows the uh, a flushing of the system instead of having type of a an absorbent granular um, that is is not an absorbent um, it will absorb uh, blood urine and vomit you want to stay away from those type um, you also have raw silica raw silica sand that's a majority of what landscapers are or throwing in their turf. And what I'm saying is by throwing in is because they're not really caring um, if there's dogs or if there's kids or whatever the case may be, they just want to get their paycheck and, and not go the extra mile by putting in a granule that uh, might uh, protect against uh, bacteria and, and such. Um, so there's those microbial uh, infills. They got the uh, granular um, uh, air, um, silica sand, which, you know, if you get an angular silica sand, uh, I, I, it's just going to compact and get hard. And then when there's a lot of traffic, it's going to cause the fibers to move back and forth and, and abrasive lines created and, and the longevity is going to go down. If you are going to use a silica, try to get some premium pharmaceutical. They even have some round ball barrack 
uh, silica across the country. It just allows for movement and less compaction and, and it's better for the fibers. But, and then there's zeolite. Um, zeolite is not considered in my opinion, a primary infill because it's not heavy enough to be used as a primary infill. I mean, an infill provides stability for synthetic turf and zeolite is primarily used for an added top dressing infill, which is, you know, placed on top to, uh, um, to combat the uh, urine, which it, you know, hits the surface. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of guys are actually purchasing zeolite because it's cheap and, and they're trying to use it in their turf because they're told so. And number one, it's, it's not heavy enough. Uh, number two, it could marsh after a few years. And um, it's, it's also um, in a honeycomb structure if you look under a microscope. And the, under the Mohs hardness scale, zeolite's only about a four. Where you got silica sand on the Mohs scale of hardness is a six and a seven. And then you got envirofill, which is coated, which is a seven and a nine. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's why you got to really understand your infills and, and what service you're going to be using them for on, on, on each one of your projects. Yeah, that's, that's good uh, information. Good stuff there. And in terms of actually, once you've chosen the infill in terms of installation, any, any tips or tricks in terms of getting that infill in? Well, I mean, you mentioned my turf brush, I guess I might as well plug it while I'm on here, but um, it, you, you just want to be able to, uh, you know, I recommend uh, and before we had thatch products, meaning that the curly cues down in between the fibers, uh, guys would go out and pre-power bloom, power bloom their, their turf, which opens up the fibers and they're thinking it's going to allow the, the infill to drop in easier. Well, nowadays, a majority of the synthetic turf on the market are a thatch infill. So what happens is when you pre-power broom them, you're separating all that thatch that, and, and, and causing it to um, kind of ball up in a sense, and it prevents the infill from getting to the, the bottom. So I recommend not pre-power brooming it, and I recommend going over at least maybe 10 to 12 passes with the infill without even touching it because it'll drop in and then just start, you know, raking it in smoothly. And then once you get it down in there, then I would go ahead and, you know, power broom it uh, at the end. Cause remember the more you power broom, the more you uh, grab back and forth with your brooms, you create static electricity and static electricity will prevent the infill from dropping to the base. And your guys will be, your guys will be bringing back a half a pallet of infill and they're thinking they're saving the boss money but then the following summer, everything starts wrinkling because they don't have enough ballast in there. And, it, and the height of the infill, what are we looking for uh, for having the right amount in there? I would say uh, 70% of your product, a minimum of a half inch below the top fiber, depending on traffic. But it's every synthetic turf product out there has specifications and each specification will tell them, hey, this product takes two pounds or 2.5 pounds per square foot. And so what I teach landscapers is, is to order the, the entire amount and tell your crew, you have to get all of this in. Don't bring a bag back Mm -hmm. because that's what happens with, you know, a lot of the synthetic turf movement because of uh, thermal contraction and and expansion, because it has to be ballast. Otherwise it's going to get hot and it's going to want to move. And I've seen synthetic turf pull away from walls, six inches in between a high school building that was in the middle of Texas, uh, Midland, Texas. And, and it pulled away because they didn't even, they left the project and because they had to go somewhere other project and the high school was on a delay and the synthetic turf set there without no infill in it. And it pulled away from the wall, six inches. Wow. Huh. So you, you gotta, you gotta get ballast. If you're in the heat regions, you definitely got to put your infill in early in the morning because in the morning, the, 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 the turf is settled to where it's at. So if you want to get paid and get off the job quickly, and uh, start putting your infill in when the turf's wrinkled, it's not going to push it down. I'm sorry, it's not. Anything else in terms of installation that you want to talk about before we move on? Anything that you, we, you think we missed? I know there's, there's so many different... Oh, we could talk for days. Yeah, we could talk a long time. And you've got a lot of great articles that we'll talk about, but anything else that you want to talk about before we move on? No, you know, synthetic turf, there's so much on the internet now and, and, and guys are learning so much. And I even tell them, you know, just research it and, uh, and practice. 
Um, but, you know, practice at your house or on pieces if you're going to be just doing seams. And, and a lot of guys don't get time to do that. They have to do it on homeowners' uh, properties. And so, but the only way we get better is by, by doing over and over and making mistakes and learning from them and, and uh, becoming a craftsman of what we do. And the first thing they should is, is have compassion and care. If you're going to be in this industry and you're just a landscaper that does turf on the side and doesn't really give a hoot, then you're not going to be really successful at the turf and, and you're going to end up having conflict, especially when you get bigger turf jobs. So, you know, if you're going to be, you know, doing synthetic turf, teach your men to have compassion and care and, and become craftsmen at this industry. Incredible advice. And the last thing I want to touch on with you is maintenance. What is maintenance like with artificial turf? What are we talking to our customer about to make sure that they understand that they do actually need to maintain it somewhat? Just keep the surface clean often because uh, when they eventually do go to rent a power broom or have their turf guy come out and, and brush it up for them, uh, they'll be bagging up so many particles and leaves that, that's been down in there. And a lot of people get shocked of how much gets pulled out of synthetic turf um, that's been wiggled down in there. And then you got to ask yourself how much bacteria and bugs and everything else been down there. And so that, so that you do want to keep it uh, blown off and clean. And, um, and you also want to be able to uh, keep it clean by chemical wise. And, uh, and I know people say, well, I thought synthetic turf is not a maintenance, but you, you, you should, you should clean it. You should also disinfect it. And um, especially if you have pets, you definitely have to disinfect it if you have pets because um, this, it, it's, it's a plastic. And so it, it, the synthetic turf, when it goes through the, the, the turf, it's going to be all over the fibers. It's going to be on the backing, even if you have 100% permanent. So if you have pets, you have to understand about the uric acid in urine and you need to flush it. And that starts with the subgrade. Because if you don't have a contractor that put in a good subgrade, you're going to be learning from JW how to flush it and you're going to create a pond because he didn't, you know, he didn't do the right excavation. Also, the, the infill, should we talk about, does that ever need to be topped up? Is that ever going to seep through the drainage holes of the backing? Well, it doesn't, that's, it doesn't uh, seep through the drainage holes of the backing. It, it will go through there. And when you pull up turf, even 15 years later, they'll have little tiny ant holes. And that's the most that ever goes down in between there. Mm -hmm. um, you have to keep the infill levels up. It's a must throughout the season, especially in the areas that have a lot of snow, um, because you'll get a lot of infill loss uh, during uh, snow seasons. And so um, you could definitely got to keep it maintained and infilled uh, for the longevity and also for, you know, warranty purposes as well. So J JW, you mentioned uh, disinfecting and cleaning your artificial turf. What are we looking for in terms of uh, cleaner on the market or coming uh, that we should be looking at to clean it? Well, um, you know, synthetic turf cleaners out there, pretty much everything's just private labeled. Um, and you don't know what you're actually getting. Uh, but I do tell you, we have a the first EPA registered synthetic turf cleaner disinfectant um, on the market. So uh, that'll be out soon. Um, and if anybody has any questions, they could uh, they could get a hold of me on that. And that seems like the best way to come to a close with this and to thank you so much for your time, JW. Uh, and where can our audience reach out to you about that cleaner? Where can our audience learn more about yourself as well as your Ask JW articles? Because that's where I found you. That's where I found a lot of great information on this topic to learn more about artificial turf. JW, where can I just, just direct them wherever you want them to go to learn more about it. you and everything that you've got going on? Oh, you know, they can just go to my Ask JW on, online, uh, get a hold of me there, or they could uh, reach out to me uh, at my email, which is uh, jw at askjw.com. Uh, you can put that on the screen. There you go. Thank you. And, um, and then just get a hold of me and we'll talk turf. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Visit us at howtohardscape.com for more information on this subject. You can type in the search bar for Synthetic Turf. An article will come up with that. And I just want to say thank you for listening to this podcast each and every week. Those of you that have left us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us wherever you can find us and just connected with us on Instagram and on Facebook. I thank you so much. We are coming in on our 100th episode, which is 
really exciting and it couldn't happen without your support. So I just want to say thank you for that. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.